Thank you all for attending. My name is Kevin Goff, and this is actually week two in a 13-part series on new features in SQL Server 2012. Uh, my name is Kevin Goff, and uh, I know that some of you attended uh, some of this from last week. Uh, again, this is a 13-part series, uh, just a sort of a Sergeant Joe Friday from uh, from the old Dragnet days, just the facts approach to covering the the new features in SQL Server 2012. Now, the only thing that you need to write down here is the link to my site, because the slide deck and the code examples I'm going to be going through are actually up there. So the only thing that you need to write down is uh, kevinsgoff.net, www.kevinsgoff.net. And if you go to the webcast area, the uh, the link to the slide deck as well as the download code is already out there. As a matter of fact, if I hop over to my desktop here, navigate over to my desktop, out on my site, just kevinsgoff.net, uh, there is a section called The Baker's Dozen Live. It's 13 uh, straight Saturdays of webcasts on SQL Server 2012 coverage. If you go down to the second link here, because we're going to have uh, one link for each of the 13 weeks, uh, if you just simply click on this link, that contains the uh, the slide deck as well as the uh, the code. So that's all you need to do is just go down to uh, kevinsgoff.net, and everything else is uh, everything else is out there. So coming back to my slide deck here. Now we are in week two, and this week we are going to take a look at the new language enhancements, the new Transact SQL enhancements in SQL Server 2012. So last week we looked at the column store index. I'm going to do just uh, just 30 seconds of review of, of uh, the content we covered from last week for anybody who, who wasn't able to attend. This week we're looking at the new T-SQL enhancements. Next week we're going to take a look at a, uh, at a specific enhancement called the file table enhancement. It uh, sort of takes the concept of the hierarchy ID and the concept of file stream one further and allows us to, uh, to maintain a, a file system through a, uh, through a, through a table-driven approach in the database engine. So we'll be looking at that one next week. So again, last week we took a look at the column store index, which is a new index in the relational database engine. It is used uh, primarily for data warehousing and data mart scenarios and gives us tremendous, tremendous increases in, uh, in query performance, uh, sometimes by a by factor of 10 or 20 or even greater. It's doing it by creating a compressed column store index as opposed to a row-based index uh, that helps out especially when querying over large amounts of data. So uh, data warehouse scans, they read through a tremendous amount of data that would uh, maybe use hash, uh, hash joins or, or hash matches for aggregations which previously could be very, very expensive uh, operations, are now significantly faster, again, as much as 10 times faster. So feel free to pull down the slide deck and the examples and, uh, and read through this, and feel free to email me if you have any questions. And we're going to jump forward now and take a look at the new language features in, uh, in SQL, Server 2000, SQL Server 2012. Now, we're going to uh, go over to uh, Management Studio in just a minute, and we're going to take a look at a, at a project in Management Studio that has, uh, has a number of queries that cover some of the new uh, language features. And so I'm going to hop over there in just a minute and take a look at the new, uh, take a look at the new language features here in 2012. Well, the first one we're going to look at in just a minute is a new feature it's actually a database object that we can put in the database engine to implement implement sequence generators. These are essentially table-independent identity values. If anyone has ever had a scenario where they wanted to create integers within tables that were unique, not just within the table, but across all tables within the database, well, you had different approaches. You would either utilize a unique identifier, or maybe uh, some people would have a, a separate table that they would sort of use to, uh, to maintain the next identity that would pass, be passed out across different tables with a, with a technique of selecting from that and updating it the same line of code. Well, 
we can now have a uh, a database object that uh, that can be used to to provide identity that or provide integer values that are going to be unique across uh, all the tables in a database, and these can be used either for uh, for four byte or or eight byte uh, integer data types. So I'm going to come over to Management Studio. So I will hop back over to my desktop here. And in Management Studio, I'm going to take a look at the uh, at the query called Sequence Generators in this project. Now this project is uh, is available on my on my site. Uh, again, it's uh, www.kevinescoff.net. And I'm going to take a look at the query here for sequence generators. Well, first of all, I've got some uh, some tables and some sequence uh, generators that I previously had that I'm going to drop. So I've got some drop statements at the beginning because there's some items that I want to create. So I'm going to run this to drop some existing sequence objects that I've got. And I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to create a new sequence. This can be a database object. I'm going to call it demo sequence. Now, I'm going to give it a, uh, a seed value of 1 and an increment value of 1. So I'll say start uh, with 1 and increment by 1. I'll push that into the database. So I'll execute that. And there is a database object that, uh, that I'm going to take a look at over an object explorer in just a minute that has, uh, that has the sequence value. Well, when we want to get the next value, because that's, uh, that's why we create this, is, is to use it sort of as a, as a table independent uh, as a table independent factory of, of integers to be passed out, I can say select next value for demo sequence. So it's select next value for and the name of the sequence object. So if I execute this, this simply gives me a value of 1. And if I run again, it gives me a value of 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. So there could have been different threads that, uh, that executed that requested the next sequence value, and that's going to pass out a new number every time. Well, if I go take a look at that over in uh, in Object Explorer, if I expand databases, and if I expand uh, AdventureWorks, which is where I'm creating this, and if I expand Programmability, well, there's a new database object folder here called Sequences, and there's the uh, the demo sequence that uh, just got created. Well, if I right-click and go to Properties, just to take a look at what's in here, well, I get the name of the uh, the demo sequence. I get the uh, the restart number, which is one, and the increment by, which is one. Now, there's the uh, the minimum and the maximum value. Now, if those numbers uh, look somewhat familiar to you, if you've ever taken a look at the uh, at the maximum range of both four byte and eight byte signed integers, you'll see that that goes well beyond the capacity of a four byte signed integer. A four byte signed integer can go up to approximately 2.1 billion uh, entries. I don't remember the exact number, but it's roughly 2.1 billion. Well, this number is obviously a lot higher than 2.1 billion, so we can use this either for 4-byte or 8-byte or, or integers. And then there's the current value. So uh, current value of the demo sequence is 5 because I've, I've uh, pulled a couple of values out of it already. Well, if I want to start using that to insert into a table, well, I'm going to create a table here called my test. And I'll have an integer column, not an identity column, just a regular integer column. And I'll call it sequence value, although I could call it anything I want. And then a name column. So I'll create just a very basic table here. And I'll insert, uh, I'll insert two names into it, my brother's name and my wife's name. So I'll run two insert statements. And in both instances, for the sequence value, I'm requesting the next value for demo sequence, the same syntax we saw up above. Well, if I query from that my test table, well, I've got the values of six and seven. So that's that's serving once again as a uh, as a table independent identity value. Well, if I come down further and if I create a uh, a much bigger integer, if I create a table called my test big int with another sequence integer as a big int and a name as a var char, so I'll execute this. And I'll create a much bigger sequence. I'll create a big demo sequence starting with 3 billion. So I'm immediately starting with a value that couldn't be used in a, in a regular 4-byte sign integer. And I'll increment it by 1 million. So I'll create that sequence. 
Well, I'll grab the next value to see uh, what I get. And I get the value of, uh, of 3 billion. And if I run it again, I get 3 billion, 100 million. And I can insert a row. So I'll insert the values of test 1 and test 2 into that my test big int table. Once again, using the, uh, the keywords next value 4 and then the name of the sequence. So I'll insert these two rows in. And then take a look at the table. And I've got test in, or test one and test two with the uh, with the next two sequences. So this is something that uh, certainly would have been uh, great to have a long time ago, but you know never uh, never a good time like now for for a good feature. And uh, this is certainly uh, on a go forward basis uh, creating a new database where you want to have table independent uh, integers that are that are unique. We now no longer need to uh, utilize a unique identifier uh, data type. We can uh, we can use the sequence approach. So very very nice feature uh, in SQL Server 2012. All right, well I'm going to come back to my slides here. And next feature that we are going to take a look at. And this is again another feature that uh, that people have been asking for for quite a while. It's a new paging construct that we can utilize when we want to uh, grab a, a subset of rows within a result set based upon a range of row numbers. A uh, classic scenario here, one that I'm sure many people can identify with, scenario where we have a web page uh, where we the result of a query might uh, bring back a thousand rows, but we're not going to show all thousand rows in a web page. Maybe we page 20 or 25 rows at a time. Well, back in SQL Server 2005, Microsoft implemented the row number function. And the row number function allowed us to, as the name implies, assign a unique row number based upon a uh, based upon an order by, and then we could uh, we could query against that. Now, since the row number doesn't get materialized until uh, after the after the select runs, we'd have to use a comma table expression or a subquery to filter against it. So we would assign row numbers to those thousand rows, and then if uh, depending upon if someone uh, were navigating to page five or page ten, and we were showing 25 rows at a time, we'd manually calculate the offset of the of the of the range of rows that we'd want, and we'd say, give us from that subquery or for that comma table expression everything between row 251 and 275 or whatever the range would be. Well, that certainly works, but uh, Microsoft has, uh, has now implemented that capability directly into the order by with two new keywords called offset and fetch. So what we can do is in the offset statement, we can define the offset of the number of rows that, uh, that we want to repass. So if, uh, if we're looking to show rows 101 through 125, well, we can offset past the first 100 rows to start at the, at the 121st row. And then we can indicate that we want to fetch 25 rows. So coming back over to, uh, to my demo here, so I'll go back to Management Studio. I will go to the next uh, query down here in the project, and that's uh, called Offset Fetch. Now, just as a uh, just as a simple example, I'm going to say that I want to read out past the first 40 rows and read the next 40 rows. So I'm going to put a uh, row number integer into here and give it a value of 40. And I'm going to query from the purchasing.vendor table in AdventureWorks, ordering by name, and I'm going to offset past the first 40 rows and fetch the next 40 plus 10 rows. So actually, I'll actually uh, start out at row 41 and grab 50 rows. Well, what we say is offset, and then uh, since I'm putting this in a variable, I could say offset row num rows, and then fetch the next x number of rows. And we place this after the order by statement. So if I execute this, well, notice how I'm starting at, uh, at Green Lane Bike. 
So I'm starting past the first uh, 40 rows. Greenland bike is actually the 41st row if we had actually displayed the row number. <coughs> and I'm getting back 50 rows now. So I'm getting back the, the, the value in row num plus 10 rows. So essentially I've started at row 41 going back alphabetically to the letter A and I'm reading the next uh, reading the next 40 rows, or excuse me, the next 50 rows. Now, uh, someone uh, question just came back. Uh, question just came back on the uh, from the first topic. So, uh, let me come back to the first topic here. Someone asked a question about the sequence generators. The question that came back was, uh, would, would next value consume the integer the way uh, the way identity does, or or will a uh, rollback make it available again? A, a rollback will not make it available again. So if I uh, put this in a transaction and then I roll it back I, I cannot use that value again so it's uh, if, if I try to select the next value into into a table and I wind up rolling it back well then I've, I've that that integer is uh, is going to be is, uh, is not going to be available again it's going to move on to the next value so just to just to demonstrate that very quickly here I think I still have this table here No, oh, I'm sorry. Let me get, let me go up to the uh, to the smaller one. In my test, uh, the next one was seven. And so, if I take a look at that demo sequence right now, if I go to the properties, well, the current value is seven. Well, if I start a transaction, so I'll just simply say begin transaction, and I'll insert my name into here. Well, it probably would have been good to have this as part of the part of the demo code. Yeah, I'll put my name in, but then I'll roll it back. So I'll start the transaction. I'll insert the uh, the next value for the demo sequence and put my name in, and then roll it back. So right now, the next value in that demo sequence is seven. If I execute this, well, that rolls it back. So in my test. Still just have the two rows. But now if I go take a look at the next value in the demo sequence, it's eight. So it's not going to uh, it's not going to roll that uh, not going to roll that back. Good question. <coughs> okay. So coming back to the uh, to the offset and fetch, I have the ability to uh, offset X number of rows then fetch X number of rows. Well, if we come down a little bit further here, just to uh, take that one uh, one next step, let's say that we had some type of stored procedure that, uh, that received a page number and a rows per page as parameters. I'm going to actually generate the row number here just to uh, uh, just to dem just to demonstrate the uh, the display of of the uh, of the specific row numbers are being retrieved here. Well, I'm going to offset. I'm going to use the old trick. Of uh, taking the page number minus one multiplied by the rows per page. So if I'm if I'm at uh, if I want to go to page five showing ten rows at a time, well five minus one is four times uh, times ten would be forty. So if I'm on page five, I'm basically going to want to skip past the first forty rows and show from row forty one to row fifty because I'm showing ten rows per page. So I can place that calculation into the offset, determine how many rows to uh, to skip. And then uh, how many rows I want to fetch next? So I'll execute this, and I get rows 41 to 50. And if I say I want page number six, well that's obviously going to be uh, rows 51 to 60. I'll re-execute this, and now I get rows 51 to 60. Now the old approach, before uh, before this capability came about, was to utilize the row number function in some type of a subquery or common table expression, and then turn around and query from it. So I could create some subquery, some common table expression that would materialize that row number because we can't use row number in a WHERE clause. We can't generate the row number at the same time uh, in the WHERE clause. Specify which ones we want. Row number is a is a windowing function. It's 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 
setting a value by reading over a set of rows, thus the name, and therefore that's uh, beyond what the WHERE clause can handle. So we had to materialize that into some type of, uh, of, of, uh, of alias that we could uh, turn around and, and uh, read on the outside of a, of a subquery or a CTE and then, uh, and then determine the rows this way. So a, uh, a slightly, uh, slightly simpler way of dealing with, uh, with paging uh, result sets. Okay, well, I'm going to come back to uh, going to come back to the slides here. And next thing we're going to look at is actually a uh, a set of uh, of new of new language features that uh, that fall under the category of, uh, of of window functions. Now, in SQL Server 2005. You had a couple of uh, window functions that uh, that were added to the language. You had you had row number and you had rank and you had dense rank, and that allowed us to uh, to implement a ranking of, uh, of of rows and result sets. So if we wanted to rank the top ten salespeople, or maybe the top ten salespeople uh, within each uh, part of the country, and then utilize some logic for how to deal with ties and how to deal with the ten with the gaps that would result after ties. Well, the ranking functions provided us uh, some capability to do that. Well, in SQL Server 2012, Microsoft uh, really, uh, really uh, went way beyond the ranking functions and implemented some additional analytic functions that uh, would be very helpful if we want to take a set of rows and, and uh, come up with some calculations like uh, like a median average or a uh, a percentile rank or or calculating cumulative distance. Now, not not every application will need to do that, but certainly uh, anything that's that's trying to get some statistics over a set of observations or or, or just values across rows. Well, these functions are really going to come in handy. And I know from my own personal experience as a developer and, and also as an instructor and an analyst as well that many times I want to get some of these statistics. Well. In years past, you'd either have to write your own functions or you'd have to throw the data over into Excel or in a, some other analytic tool. Well, there are now there are now these features uh, that are built into the uh, that are built into the language. Now, uh, by the way, I've had a couple of people uh, I've had a couple of people who have uh, said that they couldn't hit my site. I'm, I'm going to do just a quick check here to make sure that uh, my Site is still available here. I'm just going to come back to the browser and once again uh, just go to kevinsgoff.net. And uh, my site is uh, is coming up. Um, if uh, if other people can check it, there's one person saying that uh, they're not able to hit my site. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, not sure why. Uh, if other people say they're not able to hit, I'll check it out later. But uh, I'm able to hit my site. It's just uh, kevinsgoff.net. So if anybody else could check that out and let me know if they're able to, to hit the site. Okay, so we're going to take a look at a uh, at a set of queries that uh, that uh, that make use of the of the over clause to come up with some scalar value over a set of rows. Now there, there's so many here that I'm going to actually show several examples. Well, let me come back to uh, let me come back to my demo code here. So I will go back to Management Studio. <coughs> and uh, guys, for everybody's forgiveness, my uh, my I've got a slight case of uh, laryngitis and a bad chest cold. I'm getting over, so uh, doing a little bit of doing a little bit of coughing. My voice probably sounds a little bit funny here, uh, so. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay, but uh, allergies in that time of the season. All right, well, I'm going to load a, uh, a query here in Management Studio. Two new functions, actually two of many new functions, called lag and lead. And this is one of these where I'm going to take a look at the result set and sort of work backwards. So I'm going to run this query. And what I've got here on the screen is uh, some order dollars, summarized order dollars from uh, from the AdventureWorks purchase order header table. 
by by order month within order year and for a particular ship method. So I've got ship method four here. And I've got uh, order dollars for January, February, and March of 2006. And then for, uh, for ship method five, the same thing. Some summarized order dollars for, uh, for the first three months of 2006. Well, obviously, everything out to the sum of total due, you know, nothing, uh, nothing earth-shattering here for the first couple of columns. But then we go two columns out to the right where I'm displaying the dollars the prior month as well as the dollars for the next month. So here in February, we had, uh, what, 80, uh, 81,000 and some uh, dollars in, in orders for this particular ship method. Well, in the prior month, it was 3384 which was the sales back in uh, in January, and in the next month it's uh, what roughly hundred thousand and some. Well, if I go back to January, there was there were no sales for the last month because this is the first month in the result set, so I've got zero, and the dollars next month is what we had in uh, in February, and then in uh, March, the sales for the prior month is what we had in February, and the sales next month is zero because I'm intentionally only showing this for a couple of months. And then the same concept down here for, uh, for ship method five. So in each case, we're showing what was the sales last month and, and what was the sales the next month if we have that data. Well, in years past, this was certainly doable, but you would need to write some type of a subquery or common table expression that would go out based upon whatever the current order month and order year would happen to be run another subquery and vary that uh, that month by one going going chronologically forward or backward. So you'd have to implement a subquery of some type. Well, in many cases, that's a theme with uh, with these window functions that come up with a, with a scalar value over a set of rows. They give us the ability to put it right here in the select without necessarily having to, uh, to resort to a subquery. Well, in this case, I've got two new functions called lag and lead. Now, if you have worked with OLAP databases and if you've written MDX code or if you've worked with, uh, with other analytic tools, you probably are familiar with the lag and lead function. Well, let's take a look at the syntax here. Well, for the dollars last month, what I can do is I can lag the sum of total due. And then I specify how many, uh, in this case, how many rows I want to go back. Now, Go back based upon what? Well, that's based upon the order by and the partition, which I'll get to in a second. So I essentially want to go back one row. And the zero indicates what we return if we otherwise get a null. If I don't provide that value, then I'm going to get a null for the dollars last month. So this is just simply a way to return something other than null. Well, in this case, I want to do it based upon the order month and the order year. I want, I want to lag one month within year. So I put the uh, order by statement in parentheses and it's order by year, order year, and order month. And because I want to do this within the uh, the ship method ID, so when I'm going back one month, it's within the ship method ID, I reference that in the partition statement. What, so one of the great things about these windowing functions is that, is that as Microsoft continues to add more of them, we utilize very common syntax of what we've seen before with the ranking functions because the ranking functions do the same thing. We rank over an ordered set of rows optionally by a partition if we want to, uh, to break out the ranking by, by some other entity. Well, then we have lead, and lead is going to do the opposite. It's going to go out one, uh, one month within year and also within the ship method ID. Now, some people ask, can you put in a negative value for lag and lead? And the answer is no. You can't turn a lag into a lead by putting in a negative value. Negative values are not permitted for that, for that second parameter. It has to be a positive value. So if, uh, if you've written reports or, or if you've needed to write queries against uh, relational tables where you need to provide this kind of a, kind of a result set, where we want to show for any one row what we had in, in the prior month, quarter, week ending date, whatever the time period happens to be, lag and lead allow us to, uh, to do that. So um, a nice new analytic feature. Now, there are a lot more than just lag and lead. I have this here as a separate, uh, have this here as a separate query, but there are other ones that are, uh, that are available. 
So if we go forward to the next uh, to the next query in my project here, if we go forward to other analytic window functions in that uh, in that PowerPoint uh, slide deck, I had a result set of some test scores, which is actually something that I deal with. Uh, Pretty regularly as uh, as an instructor, you know, I, I I deal with test scores and I like I like to take a look at uh, at averages over time and and I like to take a look at uh, at at uh, any uh, impact of uh, of outliers of, of test scores or maybe you know that, that deviate uh, widely from the uh, from the normal average. Well, in T SQL, these uh, many of these functions are not available, and so we either have to write that code ourselves, or we need to go throw the data over in Excel or some other analytic tool. Well, Microsoft has added a number of new analytic capabilities. Well, I've got a, uh, I've got a table here that I've created of test scores, and I'm not going to go through all the code that generates this, but basically I'm creating randomly 18 test scores between 65 and 100, where I'm randomly coming up with a, uh, with a score. And then I'm going to create two test scores uh, between 30 and 40, just to have a few outliers here. And then at the bottom, I've got a select statement with a number of new analytic functions. Now, once again, this is one where I'm going to uh, generate the result set and work backwards. So I will execute this. And I've got a good, good, one, good one here because I've got some deviation between the the overall average score and the median scores. Now, like I said, I'm going to take this a couple of uh, couple pieces at a time. I'm displaying the 20 uh, the 20 scores of the screen. So I've got test scores ranging from two people had a 97 and two people had a 95 and some low 90s and some 80s and uh, uh, two people who uh, did, didn't do, didn't do so hot. I intentionally threw those at the bottom so that we could see the impact of outliers on a uh, on an average score. Well, the first column here is the average score, otherwise known as the mean as the mean average. A, a normal average where we just simply sum the other values and divide by the number of observations is, is a mean average. And analytically, I sometimes say it, it is definitely mean because you know obviously one uh, one bad number or or one very good number outside of uh, an otherwise uh, large large set of bad values can really uh, impact the uh, the average. Well, I can average that test score over. Now, in this case, uh, I want to do it by each class ID to come up with the overall, overall average score. And that overall average score here is a, is a 79. But that's not really reflective because of these outlier conditions at the bottom. Analytically, many times what, uh, what people want to do is they want to utilize another type of average called a median. A median is, is basically the score in the middle. Now, mathematically, there can be a little bit of uh, variation on how you calculate that median. It might be an absolute median, or it might be one. Uh, it might be one that we interpolate. As an example, we've got 20 rows here, so we can't really have a, a single observation in the middle. We could only have that if we had an odd number of rows. If we had an odd number of rows, like for instance, we had nine rows here. Well, the one in the middle would be the fifth row. The problem is with 20 rows, we, we don't have a single value in the middle. We have, we have two values, and, and they're basically the 10th and the 11th value when we order these by test score. So one way to calculate the median would be to take the mean average, the regular average, of the, of the, uh, of the two in the middle here. Well, that would be 84.5. But other people might say, no. We only want to have one observation, and if it uh, if we have a an even number of uh, of rows overall, we would simply take the higher of those two between uh, rows 10 and 11. So some people might view the actual median as as 85. Well, that's a topic for another day about which one would be more val valid. But the point is that there are two possible ways we could calculate that. Well, Microsoft did not add a median function in SQL Server 2012. It, now, historically, we could calculate that by generating a row number and then uh, determining the two row numbers in between and doing a mean average, 
and it's uh, an approach that many people have written about over the years. But we can now do it directly using a, uh, a new calculation, a new function that's, uh, that's in the language. Now, Microsoft didn't call it median. They basically added two new ones called percentile continuous and percentile discrete. A, a median is essentially what we're looking to find the 50th percentile. Well, that's what we can do here. We can call the percentile function, and if we want to get uh, an approximate number, so if we, have an, if we have an even number of values, we would essentially get the mean average uh, between the two in the middle. We could call percentile continuous and pass in a value of 0.5. So 0.5 is essentially the score in the middle. Now, the implication there is that if we wanted to get not necessarily the one in the middle, but the 60th or the 70th percentile, we could put in a number there between 0 and 1. So we could put in 0.7. Probably the most common use, or certainly one common use, will be to use this as a median where we put in 0.5. Now, we have to use a, a specific keyword here. We have to say within group, and then order by test score descending, and then over and I'm going to do it over the, uh, the, the unique identifier in this table, which is the class ID. <coughs> and that winds up being the, uh, the median interpolate. So the median interpolate gives us the, uh, the number in the middle here. And, and it's essentially the mean average between 84 and 85. Well, then there's percentile discrete. And percentile discrete is going to give us a single observation. And in this case, the higher the two, which is 85. So we now have three pieces of information here. The overall mean average. I'm certainly not saying that that doesn't have some value, but it's really not a good idea analytically to use a mean average without also utilizing a median average because we want to see if there's, if there's uh, any impact that outliers might, uh, might play on the data. So I, I know as a, as a part-time analyst, this is, uh, this is a nice new feature to have in the database. Well, there are also two new functions called first value and last value. Now, I, full disclosure here, I had a little bit of difficulty really, uh, really understanding the impact of these, especially last value. Essentially, they allow us to get the, 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 first, the first number and the last number over a set of rows. That's why they call it first and last value. Well, the first value here is essentially the same as the min, the, the minimum score overall. So the first value of the test score over the, uh, the test scores is going to give us the lowest value. Well, we can also call last value. Now, I'm calling last value two different ways. So notice how I've got high score overall one and high score overall two. Well, maybe as we read through the rows, we want to calculate what was the highest score at that point? Now here, it, it, it's essentially the same as the score. So you know, nothing earth-shattering here. But the point is that, uh, that, the, uh, that that last value for the test score could be over something ordered than the uh, order by test score. Maybe we want to know what was the, if, if people were taking the test and, and there was a specific time where they finished the test, Maybe we wanted to know 30 minutes into the test what was the highest score. And then 35 minutes into the test when some people submitted their test, what was the highest score. So we could actually get what was the highest score at a particular point in time. So that one is, is once again going to let us uh, get whatever was the last uh, value at that point in time. Well, there's also the ability to specify a subset range here. We can actually say range between current row and unbounded to give us all the following rows. That is essentially going to give us the same as the max. So for every row, we are essentially displaying the, uh, the maximum value. As I said, I had a little bit of difficulty at first with this. It's kind of like, kind of like uh, determining your left from your right, but about, uh, about a thousand times more complicated. Other people might be able to, to, uh, to tap into that right away. But uh, we have the ability to get the first value and the last value over a set of rows. Now, the next two out here are, are nothing new. I'm just simply showing them out here uh, as reference for the next couple of functions. I've got a rank, and I've got a dense rank. Well, the rank is going to give us the, uh, 
the, the, the positioning of the scores in order of test score descending. So the two people who scored 97 are both ranked number one. But the rank function leaves gaps. So the next one down here is going to be number three. So the person who scored 95 is ranked number three because there were two people uh, tied ahead of that person who had a who had a higher score. So the rank function that we use to rank over a set of rows ordered by test score descending gives us a uh, gives us the rank that we see here. So it accounts for ties, but it leaves gaps in between. Well, maybe we view that 95 as the second highest score. We want to place more analytic weight on the unique instance of every test score here. In that case, we use the dense rank. So the dense rank accounts for ties, but also closes the gaps. Now, which one would you use in an analytic setting? Well, that all depends upon the, the business requirements. The point is that both of these are available here. Now, that's a segue to the last two out here, called percent, called uh, percent rank and cumulative distance. Now, the mathematical formula that we would use to derive these is actually pretty similar, but the way that they might be used in an analytic setting might be uh, might be very different. Well, first we've got the uh, the percent rank. Well, the two here at the top are, are at the top are, are, are at the top percent wise that they have the highest score. Well, row number three here, row number three here is in the top 10%. The same, same thing with row number four. They are in the top 10% with respect to the, uh, to the number of rows. So that's going to be the relative standing of the row. And we, we can essentially derive this by taking the rank minus one divided by the total number of rows minus one. Now, notice the significance of, of the use of the, of the rank. The percent rank uses the rank, not the dense rank. So notice how both of these are at uh, are 10 are at, uh, are at a percent rank of 10, or roughly 10. Had uh, had this person who scored the 95 been by himself, and had this person who scored the 97 been by himself, obviously the ranks here would have been different. It would have been one and two, and not one and three, and so we get a different percent rank. So when it determines the relative standing of the row. It is essentially using the other rank function. Now, there's also another one where the calculation is similar. It's the number of rows uh, less than or equal to or greater than or equal to the value that we're utilizing for the order by, divided by the number of rows. But the usage here is very different. We want to get the cumulative distance as, as an index between the top row based upon test score descending and the bottom row. Well. In this case, I'm not multiplying it by 4 the way I did with the percent. I want to show that as an actual position. So the person down at the bottom had a distance of, of 100% or 1 from the, uh, from the top row. Now, that's the same as the, uh, as the percent ranking for the person with the worst test score. However, the cumulative distance to the top includes that row, whereas the percent rank doesn't. So a little bit of difference in the calculation, but these are going to be used in different settings. Most people are probably more familiar with the percent rank. Cumulative distance might be used in, in instances of probability. So these are the new analytic functions in, uh, in T-SQL, and they, they are pretty significant. Now, again, not every application is going to use these. It, it might be that data is fed into another analytic database where these might be utilized, but more and more, there are scenarios where people have relational databases and they want to implement analytic capabilities, but there are no other analytic tools are being used, or we simply need to get these statistics in a, directly out of a relational database. So Microsoft has added a number of these, and they are uh, they're pretty significant. I know myself, I'm definitely happy to see the uh, the two the uh, the function for the uh, for the median implemented through the percentile continuous and the percentile discrete. So some some pretty nice capabilities there. <coughs> and, and again, the, uh, the last value, that is the one that is the trickiest to understand. Uh, essentially, last value ordered by the test score without any other conditions. If, if we go down to the, uh, to the bottom here, if I say I want the last value ordered by the test score, 
as uh, as uh, high score overall two. Well, that's going to give me the highest score up to that po- up to that point in ascending order. Notice the significance of, of the order by the test score in ascending order. So that's simply the highest test score based upon the number of rows that have been read in up to that point. And then when we come up to 37, well, the highest test score over those two rows that have been read up to that point is the 37. Again, that, that's the same as, uh, as the test score. But the significance here is that we might want to order by the, the time that uh, the test was submitted. Now, if we want to know for every row, what was, the, what was the highest test score over all the rows? Well, here we can put in a range between whatever the current row happens to be and all of the following rows unbounded. So th- th- this is a little bit of a culture shock here to see this for the first time. But essentially, this allows us to either give us the, uh, the last value just within the number of rows been read up to that point, ordered by test score, or for all of the rows following. I, I, I admit I had to look at that several times before I really got it. This is not one that's, uh, that's intuitive, or, or at least not one that's going to be obvious at the beginning for most people. Okay, well, just a couple more to go here. So come back to uh, come back to my slide deck. Now th- those actually represent the major the major new functions. There are a couple of other minor ones here, but those represent the uh, the major new windowing functions. So again, we've got lag and lead to give us the the uh, the prior rows or the, or the or the or the next rows in a result set order by particular order. We now no longer need to uh, to utilize a separate subquery or common table expression to to derive those and vary them by one or however many we want to lag or lead. We've got first value and last value to get the, as the name applies, the first and last value over a set of rows and optionally specifying a range. We've got percent rank and cumulative distance, and then we've got a median function that's available through percentile continuous and percentile discrete. Well, last page on here, some smaller features, but they still have some value. Now, first of all, there is one, and I just recently discovered this one. You know, I've I've been working with 2012 from the very beginning, but uh, of, the, of the first CTP that became available. But I just discovered this first one, actually, just the other day. I don't have an example for it yet. But uh, if you're running uh, stored procedures and you'd like to uh, get uh, a result set back that describes the first or maybe subsequent result sets. There is a there is a system sort procedure called SP describe first result set that uh, that determine that is going to bring back the result set or going to bring back the structure of the result set. Well, here's the significance of that. There might be times where we would like to change the structure of a result set, either the column names or maybe the data type. Maybe we're working with a legacy store procedure and we like to change something. Well, let me come back to my desktop here. And back in Management Studio, I'm going to go to, uh, it's actually Query 4, it's Execute with Results. Now, there, there have been times where I definitely could have used this one in the past. Let's say that we have a stored procedure, a very simple one called get vendors. And it simply brings back a couple of columns from the vendor table. So I'll push this procedure into the database. No, nothing uh, significant about it. Well, let's say that I want to run that procedure, but for whatever reason, I need to bring back that column for credit rating with a different name. So I want to bring it back as credit rating 2. Now, in reality, maybe the store procedure brings it back as credit rating 2, and we want to call it credit rating. But either way, we want to change the, uh, the name that's, uh, that's coming back. Well, what we can do in that instance is we can call the store procedure, and at the end, we can specify the keyword with result sets. Now, if you ever use grouping sets, in SQL Server 2008, a very nice new feature in 2008. And I definitely recommend checking it out. It is an often overlooked feature that uh, it's 
particularly handy if you want to get uh, multiple sets of, of, of group by statements, group by results into a, into a single result set. Well, in the same way that we have grouping sets, we also have with result sets. And what I can do with that is I can, in parentheses, I can redefine the column names and even the data types that are coming back. Well, that's assuming that, uh, that it will cast cleanly to a different data type. So, for instance, that credit rating in, uh, in SQL Server is it's either an integer or maybe a tiny int. Maybe I need to bring it back as a bar chart 5. I can run that procedure and I can redefine the result sets and provide an alternate uh, definition here. So if I execute that, that brings back the result sets from the procedure, but now credit rating is called credit rating 2. And now it's it, it's not obvious here, but it's actually coming back as a varchar 5. So once again, if you've got a legacy procedure that, uh, that brings back some strange column names, you'd like to redefine them. You can do so with, uh, with, the, with the with result sets uh, statement after the, uh, the execute of the procedure. And the implication of the word sets is that if the store procedure we're bringing back two or three result sets, we can actually specify multiple sets here and just separate them with a comma. So we have an outer set of parentheses here and then an inner set for each uh, result set indicating that we could put multiples in here. All right, well, a couple of other new functions that are available, and uh, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because, they're first of all, they're very, very short. First of all, there is a there is a new function in T-SQL called concatenate. Now, there's nothing that you couldn't do before here, but let's say that we've got three strings and one of them is a null. Well, by default in T-SQL, if you try to uh, say column one plus column two plus column three, and column two happen to be a null, well, you get a null. Now, there is a setting in SQL Server when you uh, when you concatenate strings that have null values, there is a setting to change that, but but there is also another way to do it uh, in the language. There's a new function called concat. What we can do is pass it a variable number of strings, and even if one of them is a null, it will still treat it. It will not uh, bring back the entire thing as a null. So if I have two columns here, and, and or three columns, and one of them in the middle is a null, that won't keep it from generating the value. Now, you still might have to implement the uh, the trick of knowing when to throw the space in. So some people might look at this and say, well, yeah, but I've been doing an immediate if or an is null or a case statement, and I've been I've been dealing with the spaces and evaluating it myself. And, and that's certainly true, nothing that we couldn't do before, but uh, just a different way to do it. Now, some other functions that uh, are available that, again, people have uh, done over the years. There's the capability to calculate an end of month. There's a new function called EO month, one that's been available in, in Excel and in other databases. Well, if I want to take today's date, today is March the 30th. And I want to get the end of month. Well, that's going to give us March the 31st. So I can pass in any date and have it, uh, have it return the, uh, the last day of that month. So if I had actually put in February the 28th of, of this year, would give me February 29th, and this year is a leap year. Now there's also the ability to, uh, to build a date from the individual date parts. So if we wanted to construct December the 24th of uh, 2011, we can call it date from parts. Once again, nothing, uh, nothing shocking here, nothing earth shattering, but we can provide the, uh, the year, the, uh, the month and the day and that'll actually bring us back uh, actually bring us back December the 24th of 2011 now we can't do the reverse we can't provide it in month uh, day year format it's got to be in year month day format now additionally if you've been dealing with date time offsets the new this was added in 2008 where you could store the the number of hours off of Greenwich Mean Time in a, uh, in a date time offset data type well there's also a date time offset from parts now this is sort of a long one but we can provide in the year, the month, the day, the uh, the minutes, the seconds, and then the uh, the number of seconds, uh, or excuse me, the number of hours uh, off of Greenwich Mean Time as part of the date time offset from parts. Now again, you can build it as a string, or you can use it this way. So just different ways to construct dates. 
Okay, a couple more here. There is now an immediate if. <laughs> Finally, a lot of people look at this and they, and when I presented this at user groups, so some people will applaud and other people will, will sort of say, well, you know, finally we have it in here. But, you know, once again, never, never a good time like now for a, for a good feature. So there's immediate if. So we can have an inline if uh, directly in, uh, in a query. And I'm evaluating the credit rating. And if it's a value of one, I'll bring back uh, a message of good credit rating. Else I'll bring back a value of bad credit rating from the vendor table. So that brings back every vendor, and its name is either a good credit rating or bad credit rating. So the first parameter, the immediate if, is just the uh, condition that we're asserting. The second parameter is what we uh, return if that first parameter is true on a row-by-row -row basis. And then the last parameter here is what we return if, it, uh, if that condition is false on a row-by-row -row basis. Okay, and finishing this up here, three more short ones. This next one I really like. If you've ever had an instance where you wanted to parse something before necessarily trying to get it into another data type, there is a try convert and a try parse. So let's, uh, let's try to convert February the 29th of 2012 as a date. So we're going to take the normal syntax for convert, and we're going to try to do it. And if that returns a null, so notice how I've got this wrapped inside of an IIF. If trying to convert that results in a null, I'll say invalid date, else I'll say date. Well, that's a valid date. So that should return the word date or good date or whatever, whatever I'd want to put in here. Well, 2011 was not a leap year. So if I execute this, I get invalidate. Now there's also a try parse. The syntax for this is a little bit more like a cast. So the question is, can I cast the word cannot be a number as an int? Well, I can't. So that's going to bring back a null. Can I cast 1,000 as an int? So I'll try to parse it. Well, that one can come back. And so that should bring back the value of 100. So we get back either a null value or we get back a value of 100. So a couple of uh, capabilities to, uh, to test out a value to see if it's going to be converted or be able to be cast as a different data type before moving on. OK, almost to the bottom here, two more. Now, most people remember that in SQL Server 2005, Microsoft implemented the capability to, uh, to do a try-catch, where we could implement structured error handling into the database. Well, there is also the ability inside of a try-catch to, instead of raising an error, which was a common technique, a very common technique in, a, in, in the catch block Was to, was to raise the original error. Well, what we can do is we can throw it instead. So instead of having a raise where we would uh, possibly raise a different error state or a different severity level or, or modify the error message in some way, where we would call raise error and maybe customize what we, uh, what we, what we return or what, what error we raise. In this case, we just simply want to throw the original error. So if I have a select one divided by zero, and that uh, gets encountered in a try catch block where a control passes down to begin catch, instead of raising an error, I can throw the original error. So if I execute this throw test uh, procedure, instead of raising an error, we simply get thrown back the original error that's thrown. Now, it's still inside of a begin catch but we have the ability to throw the original error back to whatever the calling application happens to be. And then finally, last one here. For anyone who has uh, struggled with trying to render a, uh, a money or some type of currency column as currency, actually bring it back with a dollar sign, and even for uh, for different uh, for different regions of the world, well, there is now a format function where we can pass in 
the uh, the actual uh, style or the actual reference to the region. So if I take a, a money column, fourteen hundred twelve dollars, and I execute this, well, I get back the fourteen hundred twelve dollars expressed in terms of U.S. currency, expressed in terms of uh, of whatever the Italian currency is, which I believe might be the uh, might be the euro. I'm not not up on that these days. I should be the uh, the symbol for France, the uh, the Saudi real, the symbol for the Saudi real, and the symbol for the Japanese yen. So if you ever want to format uh, a dollar figure using the dollar sign for whatever country you're dealing with, we could call format. We can format the currency as whatever the uh, the style is going to be, and books online and the online help list the uh, the different uh, the different countries that are supported here. So a number of smaller ones, the uh, the big ones in here are the sequence generator, the offset catch capability, the uh, the lag and lead, and the analytic functions. The other ones uh, small but but certainly uh, useful. So we have actually come to the end here. So let me come back, uh, come back to my slide deck. And again, you can go, coming back to, uh, to my bio page here, you can go to my site and pull down the slide deck as well as the, uh, as well as the demo code. It's just uh, kevinsgoff.net, and it's in the Microsoft webcast area. I think I have the, the page set up where it actually is the first page that shows. And also, uh, I... As I mentioned uh, before, I train for a company called Set Focus. I'm actually the SQL Server Business Intelligence Practice Manager there. We offer training in SQL Server and .NET and SharePoint and Business Intelligence. We have a free training site with 100 hours of free training on, on, uh, on our curriculum. Actually, some of uh, the 100 hours is actually recorded content from our curriculum that we put out in this free training site called freetraining.setfocus.com. And I've also got a reference to this in the, in the slide deck as well as up on my site so you'll feel free to, uh, to check that out now uh, one or two questions have come through I'll uh, I'll reply to them uh, I'll reply to them on my uh, on my blog so uh, want to thank uh, want to thank everybody for coming apologize for the uh, for the audio issue we'll get that uh, resolved next week now next week uh, same time same station we'll be talking about the new file table enhancement in uh, SQL Server 2012 this is sort of a an interesting combination of some of the things that we could do with the hierarchy ID and what we could do with the file stream. If we have some scenario where we have a maybe a, a hierarchical folder structure of documents and we want to manage it through a table driven approach through uh, through insert uh, update and delete statements back in SQL Server, we actually can. The file table allows us to uh, to synchronize a, a document structure among other things, from the relational database. Actually, actually a great feature, is, uh, as we're going to see next week. So thank you all for, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for attending. And uh, there are a few questions that came through that I'll answer on my blog. Uh, and so feel free to drop me an email if you have any other questions. My email address is, is also on the, on the slide deck. It's just uh, kgoff at kevinsgoff.net. So thank you all for coming, and uh, have, a, have a good day and a good weekend, and uh, same, see you here next Friday, same time, same station. So, so long and have a good weekend, everybody.